uh, share uh, as uh, during the first lecture, I did not have uh, access to IS-1905. Uh, and this is related to uh, to this equation in the to, which is very important. In fact, there are two 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 aspects I would like to mention. That is that equation which actually governs a lot uh, the equation for axial load resistance um, on page um, uh, page four of the handout. That was the first uh, topic we discussed. That is the equation for uh, axial load resistance, and there is this factor K S, which I mentioned is from the uh, from uh, it is stress reduction factor in Table nine of IS one nine o five. So I assume that um, a number of uh, you are not maybe familiar with IS one nine o five. So I would just like to point out a couple of things regarding that. Um, so uh, if needed, we can share. I believe you have access to the code uh, online. Um, in Table 9, which I will uh, show, um, uh, there is this equation for Ks. Um, there is very little reference in this uh, confined masonry code to IS-1905, but uh, this is one of the things that uh, one of the items where you need to access uh, um, this uh, code. So Table 9. So you can see this from this Table 9. It says stress reduction factor for slenderness ratio and eccentricity. So slenderness ratio is the ratio of height to thickness of the wall, and it goes from 6 to 27. And there is eccentricity of loaded, loading divided by the thickness of the member. In this case, you can use eccentricity zero because we are talking about axial load resistance. So eccentricity should be zero. And um, let's say if we have uh, slenderness if you have 23 centimeter uh, thick wall and we have about three meter height uh, of the wall or we have 3.2 meter height that is typical 3.2 divided by 0 0.23 we have 14 um, uh, slenderness so this factor is 0 0.78 so that is something i would like to um, emphasize and in fact i will um, include that in the in this annotated lecture uh, but oops, uh, in the in the lecture. But what I would like you to uh, to know, and actually I go back to the lecture uh, to that uh, note, is that for this KS factor, I think I have opportunity here where I was writing about KS. Uh, so for KS factor, uh, KS um, depends on H over T ratio. Maybe I wrote already. Okay, so here is okay. So uh, what I want, I miss to emphasize that, and I would just like want to make sure that in this case, wall height is only for one floor. One story. So then if you have a two story building, um, let's say uh, something like this, a two story building, Foundation, one floor, other floor. So height will have to be for this purpose will be only this. And this is thickness. So only one story. Do you, um, do you, um, is this clear? Why is it just one story for this uh, height to thickness ratio? Can anybody? Answer. What do you think? Why? Because you remember that when we talked about uh, the other aspect of um, for in plane, we I said at one point that we use the overall height. So in this case, we take uh, the height of one story because we assume that the wall is supported. See. For, for slenderness, it is supported at the story level. So each floor is considered separate. So that's that. this is the deformation under P, P loading would be that it has support at each floor. So, uh, so that's why it is important to have only one story height, not entire. So let's say in your, in your uh, assignment, you have a bungalow, which is G plus one. 
So you have a choice of taking a height of one story or the height of entire bungalow. So you are taking only one story height for this, this check. Please note that that is a, and that is because you assume that there are supports at each floor for the for this type of loading. So you have to think about uh, that height in different contexts. That's what I want to mention. So, anyways, this is the last thing from the previous lecture. I also shared with you. So the lecture is uh, I will share annotated lecture, so you will have original and annotated notes. Uh, I will share after this uh, presentation. And uh, I also shared with you a paper by Professor Juan Jose, which basically explains the um, this F factor. So this was a paper published in the uh, Earthquake Spectra Journal in 2015. He published several papers on this topic, but in this paper he showed uh, why uh, and what is also interesting, he showed the equations for shear. That is, you may be interested to see that. You remember I mentioned that shear equations are so different from country to country. Here you can see from you, uh, two different equations in the States in two different codes. And this is CSA's Canadian code and this is New Zealand code. You can see that the equations are very different from code to code. So this is a very good paper and I would suggest that you uh, uh, read, to read it. Um, you don't need for the course, but for your own reference. I shared with you, for example, yesterday, five different papers related to modeling. This is all very important reference. For this, for Juan Jose's papers, he has more papers, but I um, I chose this one for, for this particular topic. Okay, so now the second lecture for today is about construction and detailing and construction of confined masonry buildings. So first uh, will be about detailing. And construction will be explained on the PowerPoint presentation, which I will present in um, on my computer, uh, which is uh, from um, on the example of uh, IIT Gandhi Nagar campus. Detailing lecture is very important because if you uh, and this is TH21, and I may annotate that. So, um, so first of all. Um, um, uh, we will talk about uh, we will talk about several topics about dimensions reinforcement requirements about how reinforcement meets uh, like what are the encourage this type this type type of thing so um, the uh, detailing uh, in terms of uh, the dimensions of these uh, tie columns and tie beams they're specified in the section 8.4.8 of the new standard. So mixed minimum dimensions for tie columns, for tie column size uh, is 150 millimeters times thickness, where T denotes the wall thickness. Uh, and uh, tie beam size is same as tie column size. But what I would like to say, usual dimensions, usual tie column, Uh, same as wall thickness. So in this case, what is minimum is not important. What is relevant is that if wall thickness is 230 millimeters, let's say one brick thick wall, let's say this is 230, then tie column would have dimension of 230 times 230. That would be the normal uh, expected. It is usually square. There is no need to have rectangular, but um, so this is wall thickness. And we can use the red color to this masonry wall. So so that is one what, what to say. That is for the tie column and for tie beam. For tie beam, again, there is no reason to have a larger dimension than that. Uh, it, it could be even smaller. It is 150 times T, but uh, um, for tie beam um, would be. So concrete in type columns uh, should have a compressive strength not less than 20 MPa. In fact, um, if we look at the initial, um, that was uh, changed a little bit. That was uh, our initial uh, discussion. In the material section of the of uh, the concrete, um, the 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 in the material section, 
uh, we are saying this is not compressive strength, we would say that uh, grade would be uh, M15 or higher. Higher, and that is specified in the clause um, uh, 5.1.3 which says that the minimum compressive strength, no, no, that is the formation unit, sorry, 5.3 uh, clause in the code. And, uh, and uh, for steel, uh, for enforcement, it is 5.4. So for 5.3 is for uh, four. And we had some discussions at the code committee meeting about what uh, grades of steel. So it is, if you read that 5.4, Four, I may go over it later, but maybe it's not needed. It is uh, allowed to have 415, 500, so it could be also FE 500, so that is later on uh, added, and uh, 550. 550. So all these grades are permitted according to IS 1786 uh, code. Uh, would be permitted. So this is something to know. FE415 was common, um, you know, and but now these grades are also used, and uh, so the code permits the use of these grades. But please note the higher FE, uh, the higher uh, yield strength uh, you have, um, smaller bar sizes you will need, obviously. So, um, and the mystery wall reinforcement, we, we are not using the reinforcement, but uh, it would be uh, 415 steel again, uh, probably, if it is there. So please note then uh, for concrete, it is uh, M15 or higher. Uh, it, at IIT Gandhi Nagar campus, it was used at least M20 uh, concrete for this, uh, for the confined masonry. Uh, obviously, I am sure you know that for uh, the smaller grade concrete, or smaller concrete strength has a smaller amount of cement proportionally and uh, corrosion is uh, high pro corrosion chances are there in confined masonry this is particularly important because concrete cover will be smaller than for normal concrete members in most cases um, so um, now these are some important uh, i'm not sure if i have concrete cover uh, it is mentioned there later, okay. So let's go to reinforcement requirements. Again, this is all important and it's important also for your assignment and for any future use. So uh, longitudinal reinforcement in uh, concrete uh, tie columns and in uh, tie beams, uh, according to, um, that is specified in a section, uh, I was mentioning 8.3, uh, so this is in section uh, 7. Uh, actually. So there are several sections that are related to this topic, 7.3.11.1. Uh, that is where you have uh, this. So um, the ratio of reinforcement is 0.8%. So the code says that the total area of reinforcement should not be less than 0.8% of the gross cross-section area of the column, of tie column, but for two-story height buildings, let's say your bungalow, you can go as low as 0.6%. So here maybe uh, we can say that the uh, raw or reinforcement ratio is 0.8%, that is general, or raw is 0.6% minimum for two-story buildings, so G plus one, up to G plus one. So now the question is, why such a small amount of steel, you know, that that is the minimum amount for concrete columns? Because reinforced concrete columns, because this is, as we say, it is not load bearing. Uh, steel is not resisting uh, bending. It is just for tension. Uh, so if you need more based on your analysis or uh, strat and time model design, you can use more. It is not a problem. But so what is meant here by this percentage? is I can uh, I can annotate uh, on this portion. So if you have a tie column and we have the reinforcement um, here, so this all four bars would be that reinforcement AS, that is all total of four bars. And uh, then this is uh, 
B times T. So this rho would be AS divided by B times T. That is the reinforcement energy, total amount of steel. So if you go for by 230, let's say imagine we have uh, 230 by 230 column, just to get a sense. 30 uh, tie column. We have that minimum that we would say that AS minimum would be 0 0.8 uh, over 100 times 230 times 230. And that would result, I would say, in four 10 millimeter bars. Um, 0 0.008 times 230 times 230 would be 423 millimeters and square. So this would be four 10 millimeter bars. This is how it was set because um, in the, there is the requirement that at least 10 millimeter bar is used. So 10 millimeter that will be later on. So anyways, this is the topic of longitudinal reinforcement. Transverse reinforcement in tie columns uh, is uh, covered in the section, um, this is now all together, uh, uh, longitudinal and transverse reinforcement um, is uh, in 7.3, so it is just all together, 7.3.11.2 and uh, 7. 3.11.3, so that is where you have. So here it's interesting that in terms of the area, minimum area of, uh, of uh, transverse reinforcement, it is based on volumetric ratio. Based on volumetric ratio. You know that for confinement. So this is the equation, ASCE is equal to that is minimum area of uh, many, minimum area of bar. ASC is the bar uh, cross sectional area. So it is S is the spacing of the uh, reinforcement. So S is expressed in millimeters. And I think this is uh, shown maybe here and uh, on the next page, and I will explain that. So ASC is actually an uh, area of two bars because it is a volumetric ratio. And um, the spacing of uh, reinforcement, tie column reinforcement, I will show here. So if this is tie column, let's use red for a longitudinal reinforcement. Let's say I can assume four bars. And for, for this reinforcement, you use this. And this is the spacing. So, and H, 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 uh, HC is the total, um, uh, is the total uh, length actually of the, if you look at the, at the, at the explanation here, uh, the dimension of the tie column or tie beam in the wall plane. So, so HC is shown here. If you look at this, it's highlighted. HC is uh, great. Um, that is the dimension in the plane. That is the one that we are looking for. And ASC is the, the total area. So let's see if we take, uh, let's say, the according to the code, the minimum spacing, let's see what it is. Uh, the minimum spacing should be, uh, according to the code, this is the code uh, requirement, not the lesser of uh, 200 millimeter and uh, 1.5 T. So we will have, I think in all cases, the 200 millimeter will govern. So in, in this case, let us find uh, what is the value. Uh, if we have 230 millimeter column and 200 millimeter spacing, let us find what would be the ASC in this case. So uh, it, if HC is 230 millimeters, because it is 230 times 230 tie column, 
and we have S is 200 millimeters, uh, maximum permitted by the code. It could be less, but it cannot be more. So then ASC would be equal to 0 0.002 times 200 times 230, and that would give you again um, So it would give you 92 uh, millimeters square. So area of the bar is equal, greater or equal to 92 over two, that is 46 millimeters square. So if you take, uh, I would say that minimum six mi millimeter bars would be needed. And on the other place, I will come to that minimum. Uh, so you will not be able to use a smaller bar size for tie uh, six millimeter fee would be minimum. So so this would be the tie column. And these two together would be ASC. So you will get this, of course, uh, annotated version of this, uh, the, the, the lecture. So this, this part is really important. So this gives you a minimum. So in design, my, always, my suggestion is always to start with the minimum value. Let's say because you have G plus one, you can start by 0 0.6% uh, percent as the minimum uh, area of uh, steel for your uh, tie columns. But uh, that is what it is. So here are some examples showing um, uh, external tie beams and all that. Uh, so now um, uh, reinforcement detailing, uh, that is the very important section. Concrete cover for the uh, for the tie columns and uh, tie, tie beam um, is uh, given in the section, and I will write it here, is uh, 9.1. So it is several sections. So this uh, some of these um, uh, the dimensions so this is section nine section nine of the is um, 17848 uh, code and that section is called general requirements OK, so in, it says that minimum concrete cover should be uh, to ties, uh, should not be less than two, 20 millimeters. So the, the requirement is greater or equal to 20 millimeters to ties to transverse reinforcement. Uh, horizontal wall reinforcement, minimum clear distance between the horizontal bar and the exterior wall surface at least 20. So anyways, 20 millimeter is the number that you need to remember in terms of the cover. Um, bar sizes um, um, uh, for a longitudinal uh, for longitudinal reinforcement, um, it is required to have, and that is in section 9.1.2. Um, so uh, minimum four reinforcing bars and the minimum 10 millimeter diameter. So this is according to the code, minimum four 10 millimeters. So no matter which steel a grade you use, you need to have uh, 10 millimeter bars. And for uh, ties in tie columns and tie beams, that is for longitudinal, for ties, it would be in section 9.1.3 and it would be six millimeters diameter. That is for ties. So it could you could use eight as well, but uh, six is the minimum. Uh, then the next is encourage. Uh, uh, encourage section is in section. Um, encourage is discussed in section 9.1.4, and uh, and the lab splices is 9.1.5. So um, in uh, encourage that um, uh, longitudinal bars shall be um, should should have. Um, uh, the, the 90, 90 degree hooked anchorage at intersections and the tie should have 130 uh, uh, 30 degree for now it is 135 uh, degree uh, hooks but there was some discussion to have uh, 90 degree hooks permitted unlike of course reinforced concrete structures 
but um, for now that would be um, 135 uh, 90 degree uh, is not not permitted uh, at this uh, stage uh, next lab splice is in longitudinal reinforcement um, a lap uh, length of the hook that is in 9.1.5 um, at least 40 uh, uh, times uh, lap splices should be at least 40 times bar diameters. And I believe that is shown here. Uh, lap sp uh, splices of longitudinal reinforcement. Actually, yeah, this was originally uh, uh, shown. So um, it would be 40 bar diameters. That is 40 bar diameters. That is the final decision or 50 centimeters. Uh, but um, 40 bar diameters is the requirement. Um, and a requ very important requirement is that um, the longitudinal reinforcement should be spliced within the middle third of the tie column height. Uh, so if you have a tie column, again, uh, the splice of, oops, sorry, I'm not sure maybe I cannot draw it uh, properly here, but uh, I'll try. Okay, so uh, if this is a tie column and this is that uh, longitudinal reinforcement, so this is um, actually, okay, let me continue to uh, do the one floor. Level. And this is the bottom floor level. So lab splice has to be done in the middle third. So that is the requirement. So maybe this is the bar it goes here. That is what, what it's meant. So that is middle third. So if you have this height. So it should be within this this zone here that it would be spliced. That is the requirement of the code. So it should not be spliced. That this is to prevent splicing at the at the um, at the bottom of the uh, you know just above the height. Uh, so and the, spl the splices should be staggered. So not more than two bars are spliced. At the, so some requirements are also there at any one location. Uh, a longitudinal bar here are 90 degree hooks anchorage for longitudinal bars at the uh, at the um, at the corners so that is what uh, was mentioned before so um, 90 degree hook to anchorage at at intersections okay um, so this uh, detailing of uh, tie beam even though as we discussed this is maybe a good place to say uh, th that we discussed that one of the reasons that confined masonry is, uh, uh, I would say, safer construction practice than uh, reinforced concrete frames because of construction issues uh, and or more simplicity in construction compared to reinforced concrete frames, it is still important to have some rules regarding the joint zone. So because one of the most problematic areas, as you uh, may be aware, for reinforced concrete are these uh, beam to column joints, how to construct them properly. So uh, joints. So how do we uh, deal with that in a confined masonry? So I'll just, uh, so it does say that um, this proper detailing is very important for earthquake performance. And here are some, um, some detailing options for the, uh, for the joint region. So this is showing a plan view of uh, the tie. So one option of the longitudinal reinforcement tie beam. So this is tie beam that we are talking about, how tie beam reinforcement is continuous or not. So one option is to have continuous reinforcement through the, through the joint. And the other option is to have several bars, to have bars and then have extra bar that goes through the joint. So these are two options for uh, tie beam reinforcement. Otherwise, uh, because um, this is a pin connection, so this is a pin connection, we don't have issues with moment transfer. So this is a pin connection. So uh, joint is pin 
connection or hinge. So you remember that when you talk about strat and tie model and the models for this, this is that pin that we have between uh, tie columns and tie beams. So we don't claim and we don't want actually to have any moment transfer. Therefore, that's why it is simpler. Right? I want to just explain. And here are some details at the edge. Let's say this is the top floor level of a building. How would you finish this? Um, how would you, this is a top floor level. This is a building with these top floors. So we are talking about the joint right here uh, in the, at the top floor. This is how it is uh, showing and uh, to give some end details of uh, both tie column and uh, tie beam. Uh, tie, tie, tie beam and tie column reinforcement to have some good anchorage uh, to close this um, this uh, this joint uh, here. Actually, that is uh, about about that. So, anyways, that is what is mentioned. And uh, this is for deeper. If you have a deeper tie beams, then it is recommended to have additional bar. Uh, to have these are some recommendations may not be in the code, but additional U shade bar. Similar as, of course, reinforced concrete practice, it is coming from reinforced concrete. So if we have a very deep uh, beam, so it is suggested to have these U-shaped bars at the ends. Uh, in terms of the hooks, uh, that's what we were discussing. Um, it is suggested to have uh, 135 degree hooks as opposed to 90 degree hooks and to have an alternate. Uh, you can see that they are alternate uh, staggered. They're not matching. And one of the reasons we need to have staggered is because the, we have a really small space. In, in spite of having 23 centimeters uh, tie columns, it is still a very small space inside this, this cage. It is very small and these hooks are interfering with casting of concrete. So this is a challenge and this solution with 90 degree hooks would be really very useful. And uh, some tests in Mexico have shown that 90 degree hooks are fine. But, uh, and I believe that in the latest version of Mexican code, this 2017 version, which I mentioned, is available only in Spanish. Uh, it is also permitted in some cases, but right now in India, we don't have that permission and it is only possible to do 90 degree, uh, 135 degree hooks. Um, Last uh, section is about foundations. We we'll look uh, at interesting foundation solutions at IIT Gandhinagar campus. What is shown here is that it is okay to have all kinds of foundations ranging from stone to, uh, of course, reinforced concrete. But uh, so it is extreme stone, stone or RC uh, foundations. But what is critical is to have relatively deep uh, plint bands. So to have deep plint beam, plint beam uh, or plint band, if you if you want to say uh, RC, of course, uh, which is necessary. That is very critical. Okay, and. Um, so I believe that is what uh, what is uh, what is needed. This is, uh, by the way, today I will share this ERI guide. It contains really good details about this uh, detailing and construction. I will share that along with the Mexican code um, today with today's lecture with the with the annotated versions of these two lectures. I will also share um, the ERI guide if you haven't downloaded. As I said, it's free download and also a uh, um, Mexican code English version. So you can see, uh, I would just like to say that Mexican code from 2004 version, which I'm going to share, which is translated in English, will, um, it is a total max masonry code. It's not only confined masonry, it contains about reinforced masonry, confined masonry, and unreinforced masonry. So it is just like IS-1905 would be expanded to include confined masonry and maybe reinforced masonry, but it didn't happen. That's why um, new code, special code was developed. So this is the end of this particular lecture. Uh, as I said, um, what I want to say is uh, reading uh, code IS, um, uh, so these topics,
topics in this lecture within uh, IS-1 uh, in the IS-17848 uh, would be in sections 7, 8 and 9 particularly sections 8 and 9, as I mentioned. So I was trying to mention any reference to this, but as they are a little bit scattered. Uh, but 8 and 9 are definitely related to uh, give lots of details about this. And uh, in this annotated lecture, you will see, because I wrote exact clause numbers. So um, so that that was all uh, for uh, for this uh, lecture. Uh, this is actually not the, the full lecture. I'm switching to, and I will hook up from my other from my uh, laptop because it is a PowerPoint presentation, and I think it's going to be better to present it. I don't need to annotate anything. But so if you have any questions about this part, I would um, uh, appreciate uh, to get them now uh, because I will not be switching to iPad later on, or even questions related to the previous lecture uh, where I uh, used iPad. So for now, I can, I think, um, uh, stop sharing, so uh, stop presenting, and I'm going to, okay, uh, I can use my, okay, so thank you uh, for attention, and uh, as I said, these are Small details, but important. Uh, they don't have any, almost any calculations, but you cannot construct any building without this type of details uh, that applies to reinforced concrete as well. So any questions about this uh, second lecture or even the first lecture, which was uh, related to design, maybe something has uh, come up uh, in the meantime, or you, you came to some uh, thought about this. Any questions? Yes, um, I think I see one hand, but I'm not sure who is that. Please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I have one or two questions. Am I audible? Uh -huh. Yes, yes, and I can see you also. Uh, uh, ma'am, is it necessary? I think so from this lecture, it is that we do not need to follow the provisions of 13920 for confined masonry. No. No, <laughs> no provisions needs to be followed. No, no, and that no. will be a year. That, that be... was that is an excellent question, Ronak. You know, when the campus was constructed, they had to follow. Tomorrow we'll have uh, Mr. Anausa, he will be talking, and uh, there was no way out. These provisions were so difficult for confined masonry, but because that was the only one that existed at the time, uh, this is basically for reinforced concrete structures. So because uh, confined masonry is masonry, it doesn't yeah. fall under that. Uh, simply, it is masonry. How do you apply that? It is a different uh, system. So that's why all provisions that are related to confined masonry, including yeah. masonry portion and concrete portion, are contained in this code. So there is no provision from IS19320. You don't have to look at that code at all. For the, great. So then we can have a column of 230 mm by 230 exactly. mm. Which exactly. Because exactly. every time writing a column of 300 mm, there is always a debate that they will never agree to that size because okay. they wanted to flash with a wall. But with this provision, it will be really easy to 230 by 230. Exactly. That is why you see there was a question on the first day why India needs a code. Because if it doesn't have a code, uh, the first thing they will direct you is to IS 13920. So and then you are stuck. Then it would be a nightmare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. So then, then there is no 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 need no reference to IS one nine three two zero. Ma'am, one more basic question I I have uh, uh, at the start of this lecture, ma'am, you talk about uh, the slenderness ratio, the unsupported mm -hmm. length. Mm -hmm. So you told mm -hmm. it is one story height. That's right. Uh, but ma'am, if I talk about the other direction, in one direction it is supported, but if I talk about the bending in the other direction, then it would be the total height. Because generally, if we design for the steel structure, then we uh, we apply that correction factor while taking the slenderness into consideration. Because in one side, it is supported. Along one bending part, it will have supported. But if I talk about bending in the other direction, then yeah, it would be the full height, uh, or we have to take one story height only. I'm a little the, bit that, uh, that is a good question. Uh, um, in the other direction, if you look at the wall and the plane, 
So one direction is vertical, the other direction is horizontal in plane, yeah. yeah, isn't it so? So the other direction, I would take the wall length if you have to check that. But normally we consider that walls are spanning vertical. In masonry, that is a normal, still maybe different and concrete and all that. But in masonry, we mostly consider walls as spanning vertically. So if they're spanning vertically, then their supports are horizontal. The su okay. horizontal supports are at the floor level, at the story level. Therefore, that's why you're considering. So you're considering slenderness always between the supports. The question yeah. are, where are the supports? If you have a horizontal spanning, then your horizontal supports would be cross walls. Or let's say we don't have that in confinement. Or actually, there would be tie columns. Yeah, because we consider that tie column element is the support. Okay. So, so you actually don't have that issue. I would say it's sufficient to check the spanning in the vertical direction and this. Uh, and, 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 and and because you see, because you see also, you are also uh, looking at the p value for the vertical direction. So if you're looking at p-value for vertical direction, then of course you're looking for vertical support, uh, vertical spanning, isn't mm -hmm. it so? You're looking for slenderness in the direction where you're applying the loading. Then again, so uh, it is easy huh? part confined masonry. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> and that, that, that's what I'm hoping is going to become favorite system. You don't need to use all these complicated <laughs> codes that people uh, don't yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> because while modeling, it in, uh, it, while modeling it in software, that correction factors, and when we apply it instead yeah, to design no, factor, it's really I, very complicated. That, uh, no, no, here it is not. And and the reality is that uh, you have gravity load only. Gravity load is gravity load. It comes vertical, so that is the only reason you are checking it in the horizontal direction. You will not have, you know, you don't need to check for that. Um, so so in this case, I would say in. 100% of the cases, your KS value will be based on the vertical, uh, the slenderness in uh, assuming vertical support, uh, horizontal supports at the floor levels. Okay, so you go floor from floor. Yeah, yeah, that's important. I have uh, found out uh, by teaching that sometimes students forget about these supports. They tend to look at the wall from uh, bottom to, that's why I emphasize, because I have experience with uh, working with students and uh, Sometimes they, I know that they are not only students here, they are more advanced uh, uh, participants, <laughs> no. but uh, I know they are also students and yeah. for them I am saying some things which I wouldn't say if, if I know that they are only professors uh, in the, no, in the lecture. students only always play students. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Thank you, Mark. Yes, yeah, so any question? And anyway, so tomorrow also, as I said, we have that lecture on uh, performance in past earthquakes, but we can have a discussion also on various topics I don't have to spend all the time, uh, you know, it's nice to show some photographs, but I think it's more critical to discuss any issues that you, the doubts that you have about modeling, any doubts that you have about design, because these are all topics that are really critical. So, of course, we want to cover Professor Chetani and I plan this course to have a variety of topics, as you can see, every lecture is a different topic, obviously, but it is important to 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 get the basics right because it is a new new technology and some concepts are somewhat new at least i would say so anyways there will be opportunity tomorrow so any other questions thank you very good questions Ron. thank you thank you any other any other questions uh yogesh uh, you can uh, yeah, yeah. yes ma'am uh ma'am so in case of cutout we have to take full height of two stories suppose uh, we have a cutout slab and a wall going through yeah, that's right. Uh, no, even if you have cut out slab uh, uh, for the slenderness for the for the yes, what we discussed now, you take the you take the it does not uh, matter whether it's continuous or not because this slab still will provide continuity unless you isolate the wall from the slab, which is not the, going to be the case. So if you don't isolate, but in confined masonry, you basically you have to have continuity of uh, uh, right. of uh, uh, you see what it is, uh, now we'll discuss about construction practice, and that is a good question that you are asking. So you have uh, the top of the wall at the floor level, is uh, there is a tie beam and then there is a slab. So you're not continuing masonry, uh, uh, you are starting a new masonry at the second floor, isn't it so? So, so definitely we, we go with this, in any masonry structure you would go floor by floor level. 
no matter whether it's reinforced masonry where you have continuity of vertical reinforcement, you will still take this slenderness a topic at the floor to floor level. So so no no doesn't matter what kind of slab arrangements do you do you have as long as you have a slab that supports it because slab provides that support in lateral direction to to this wall. So as long as you have slab there is no issue there is no doubt what what h should be taken height for this check. So it's not very high slenderness as I said for 23 centimeter wall with normal height, we just came up with 14. That's not. In reality, I wanted to say, and I don't know if you noticed in Professor Juan Jose's lecture, uh, by the way, I'm sure he will share if he has not shared the lecture. In Mexico, the slenderness of up to 25 is permitted for floor level. So in reality, it is permitted to, to construct half brick thick wall in confined masonry. So, and it is acceptable from the slenderness point of view. Uh, but uh, I would say that it is not practical. And in India, for thermal conditions, I don't think these walls would be practical. In Indonesia, they are constructing all the time half brick thick wall, even though climate there is also hot in some places. But that is interesting point. The slenderness up to 25 is, is actually permitted in, in some countries. And no problems with, at, at least from that point of view, because of confinement and all that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? We are we are not ending the lecture. I'm just switching to other device, so you can ask the questions later on, and uh, I can always we can also discuss off the uh, record on Google Meet or something. There is no problem. Uh, if you want any clarification, I'd be happy to meet uh, separately of the, the 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 class time. So. If there are no any last call for the questions, then I will I will reconnect. Uh, just please note, I'm reconnecting. I will uh, disconnect from this device uh, just in case to avoid echo and all that. And I will connect now from uh, from my computer, and then uh, we'll have a PowerPoint, which I believe you have a handout about construction of ITG and campus. And I will show some very interesting construction features and challenges, and uh, which will be also discussed tomorrow, I'm sure in the lecture. So if you don't have questions, I'm disconnecting and I'll connect in a second from the other device and we'll continue this presentation. Uh, different presentation, it's more colorful, it's completely colorful and uh, I think it's good for the end. You may be tired. Uh, so I'll stop now. Participants are requested to wait. Ma'am will be joining in a couple of minutes. You don't have to leave the meeting. Okay, I, I, I need the present, presenter privilege, please. Uh, just a minute. If you can give me just the privilege, sorry about that, uh, uh, because I need to share screen. Just a moment. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I can work. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes madam. Excellent. So now you'll see one. Uh, This is, uh, I hope you can see the screen. 
So, um, uh, so this is about confined masonry construction at IIT Gandhinagar campus. I will uh, particularly emphasize some points related to construction issues, and uh, more discussion will be tomorrow, both regarding design and construction issues or challenges at IIT Gandhinagar campus. So, as you know, uh, I don't know how many of you had a chance to visit the campus. So it is, uh, I'm, for me, it's one of the most beautiful campuses in India. I visited or visited anywhere uh, with lots of uh, beautiful plants and buildings are nice and it's new, obviously. Uh, it is located at Palaj village close to Gandhi Nagar. Uh, 400 acres of land were taken over in August 2012. Construction started in June 2013 and the campus was occupied in July 2015. So very qu quick uh, construction. Uh, in fact, construction was still going on when uh, the campus was occupied. So within two years, the campus was occupied from start to end, but construction continued. Uh, so this project features the first large scale uh, field application of engineered confined masonry in, in India. This is Sabarmati River, which um, I believe all of you from uh, either Ahmedabad or Gujarat know it's a very important river and unfortunately dry part of the year. So uh, the campus is on the banks of the river. Um, this circled, uh, this is a master plan of the campus. Uh, initially, six student hostels were constructed in confined masonry and also uh, 30 housing blocks. Later on, more hostels were constructed in confined masonry, additional six hostels, I believe. And then um, uh, at this uh, point at the back of the campus, there was a housing um, complex for um, uh, like visiting scholars or uh, PhD scholars with uh, children, with families were also constructed in confined masonry that was done in 2019. Uh, it's not marked here, but there's more more buildings in that type. And plus the bungalow of directors bungalow is also constructed in confined masonry. It's a single story building. So lots of confined masonry construction. Academic blocks are constructed. All the rest are academic blocks. They're constructed in reinforced concrete, mostly reinforced concrete frame buildings um, in the academic area. Um, so um, so, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, that is it, faculty and staff housing and student hostels in confined masonry. Um, student hostels, first of all, a little bit about student hostels. I will, I have here only first six hostels and uh, information about them, but the similar construction was done uh, later on, uh, on more hostels. So for these six hostels, there's G plus three. Uh, uh, the size of the buildings and the total built up area footprint 36,000 square meters. Uh, they have complex plan shapes that so that uh, joints, uh, as I mentioned, seismic gaps had to be constructed to divide buildings into regular uh, segments, um, or that is how it was decided. These are plan views of hostels. You can see that they're really complex shapes. I mean, they're U-shaped or um, or like a closed shape, uh, so that is uh, it. So this is uh, something I've already shown, how a typical hostel is divided, oh sorry, uh, into the blocks and each block, uh, in, in between two blocks there are seismic joints. So in this case there is one, two, three, four blocks and I mentioned and that is the case for all the hostels that this middle, po uh, the portion at the bottom uh, uh, right corner is constructed as a reinforced concrete frame. It's also separated from the adjacent the blocks, and that was uh, just considered to be simpler for from the construction and design perspective, and that's how it was done. And that is a that is applicable to every single hostel. So the portion where there are staircases, uh, um, like that, uh, that one portion is in reinforced concrete, and the rest is confined masonry. So these are construction exterior walls in confined masonry because, as I explained earlier, fly ash bricks were used. You can see even some efflorescence of the bricks. Uh, they, you cannot see clearly the uh, confining elements, but they are confining elements, tie columns at every end of this, um, at every opening. These openings are rather small because these are student hostels, so that is how it was possible. Every uh, These were separate rooms and they have a each room had a window and all that. 
So, uh, and these are hostels after uh, plastering, uh, uh, plaster was applied. So right now, of course, paints are also applied. So you cannot see uh, specifically confined masonry elements. There is, I would suggest if you are interested in this um, boat design and construction, this is a link for the, I believe the link is still valid. There are a number of excellent publications which are colorful and very nicely illustrated about um, design evolution of hostels. This may be more interesting, this one may be more interesting to architects, but it, it is interesting to everybody, I think. Uh, there is a separate publication which I'll mention later about construction of the campus, which definitely I would suggest that you download and uh, some copies are available in printed from IIT Gandhinagar, but uh, I think you download the electronic copies. So housing, um, for housing, as I said, initially 30 uh, G plus two story buildings were constructed. These are faculty and staff housing and total built up area of housing is 51,000 square meters. There are 270 apartments in total, three types, types one, two and three. Built up area ranges from 108 meters square, that is the smallest, to 256 meters square, that is the largest. So type one, two, and three. They're very spacious apartments, as you can see by the by the plan area. Really spacious for government uh, buildings, I would say. Um, so I think they're a maximum what it could be. This is a view of these blocks from the top. And what you can see here that you can see that three blocks are grouped together around the common staircase. That is interesting. You can see this at the right corner. You can see that trend and uh, they, they will be expand the joints between the staircase portion and the block portion. Again, the same logic as for the All the participants have requested to remain in the meet. There might be some network issue.
Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. You can me. Sorry, I think I was disconnected. I was disconnected because of internet connection. Uh, I will continue the lecture. I'm really sorry. Uh, it took me some time to reconnect. Uh, hmm. Okay, so can you hear me? Um, your voice is slightly breaking. All the participants are requested to remain in the meet. So, sorry for the interruption, and uh, it is due to the network connectivity problem. So please remain in the meet.
Ron, you are on mute. Yes, can you please give me a pre privilege? Uh, I, uh, I have a problem. I think I can upload the presentation, uh, but yeah, I need the privilege to to do that. So can you give me a privilege? I will uh, I will use the uh, the PDF version. Can you give me a privilege for sharing? Sorry for delay. It will take another 15 minutes, so we should be okay, I think, time-wise. Uh, let, uh, let me try to finish it. Um, it is my internet problem, uh, unfortunately. Um, it happens. So I'll continue where I started, where I con uh, stopped. Can you just give me sh sharing privilege? So I'm again on my iPad and I will share the presentation from iPad. Um, Okay, can I get the pri uh, privilege now? I think I am okay to uh, present. Uh, can I get the privilege for present? Uh, hi, I can see I am presenter, but I cannot see the. So I'll connect again. Okay, that's okay. Okay, I'm muted. So, uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, madam. Oh, excellent! Thank you so thank you so much. Uh -huh. uh, that is great. So I'll just continue with the presentation. Sorry, it will take another fifteen minutes. I think we should still be within time. Uh, I'm sorry for this inconvenience. So, um, so I think that is where we stopped at the housing. Um, uh, we said that uh, for housing. Um, there are uh, these uh, housing blocks, which are uh, which are three blocks. If you look at it, and now I can annotate, which is nicer. So you have three blocks, which are uh, around the common staircase. That's how it was organized. And these blocks are separated from the staircase. That is how it was done. Um, so um, so this is a typical apartment. Uh, so you can see um, uh, these are three apartments. Uh, which are around that same staircase. We can see seismic gaps here uh, at, the, at the location. So these are three apartments around the same staircase. So that is one housing block, actually. It is the same housing block. Sorry, this was wrong. So this this is the one block. Uh, uh, this is the same block. So this is, let's say, block two. I used to stay in block two. I, so when I was uh, teaching at IIT Gandhi Nagar, I was staying in this housing. So. This is housing construction uh, at IIT Gandhi Nagar. You can see um, what is, uh, and that was one of the big challenges. Uh, if you look carefully here, you can see a lintel band. So this is lintel band, and this is a floor floor system. So it was really uh, such a small amount of brick uh, masonry between the lintel band and the floor. This almost didn't make sense, but it was simply that was decision was made to have lintel bands at uh, at um, for every uh, floor, and uh, as you know, uh, I mentioned that that for the code it's also required. So um, so, anyways, that is one of the challenges. Housing construction um, at the IIT Gandhinagar campus. These are some photographs of uh, after the the pl uh, plastering was done, before and after. 
So you can see uh, now, of course, uh, with this finishing, you cannot uh, uh, tell that it was um, uh, that there was uh, uh, there is confined masonry, but uh, it is all confined masonry construction, of course. So. Um, so then this is the uh, housing block in its present state with the finishing and uh, and all that. Uh, so there is also another design publication about housing. So there is one on hostels, there is one on housing. It more has architectural features, but it is interesting. It's very well presented. So um, here is actually, this will be of interest to you, construction schedule and materials. Um, this is amount of uh, concrete, steel and bricks for housing, for hostels, and for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for academic buildings. So you can see that the concrete, amount of concrete in uh, housing and uh, uh, hostels is much less than academic blocks. But then again, uh, I think square footage is missing uh, the footprint area that would be useful to have. But uh, anyway, some of this information is pre presented in the in that construction publication, which I will share with you. So here are the construction costs. You remember that uh, somebody was asking about uh, direct comparison of construction costs. This is from construction publication, which I will share a link for uh, later on. So built up area is here for high faculty, cost per square, uh, cost total cost, cost of rupees per square meter for, for high faculty and um, um, for the faculty and uh, staff housing. And then you can see cost for hostels. So you can see it is on the order of close to less than 9,000 rupees per square meter, where for academic buildings, which is reinforced concrete frame with mason infills, it is about 15,700. It is at that time, it was around 2015, of course, the cost would be. Um, so here are unit costs, uh, rupees per square meter, in uh, that is uh, this is only based on structural cost. So this eight thousand is based on structural cost, and based on the total cost when everything else is added finishes, then it becomes uh, much higher, obviously. So, anyways, uh, this is uh, the only comparison that is available based on the IIT GN campus. Um, there could be other comparisons, but uh, it is not uh, available for the for this campus construction. This is a uh, con key challenges a little bit about that. This is Professor Sudhir Jain uh, before the construction of new campus started. Uh, he decided to that was his decision to com to use confined masonry for the co co construction and nobody understood what confined masonry means. So he requested uh, um, uh, construction workers to construct a sample confined masonry wall on the in the Chankheda campus to explain. You can see this tooting here and he wanted to explain how what is confined masonry. So they had another uh, confined masonry um, uh, tie column here and this is the tie column here where he is standing. So there was a significant training was required for uh, masons, for construction workers, for uh, for everybody, engineers uh, of CPWD, engineers who were and contractors. Uh, so building materials, uh, I already covered this part, so I go quickly about that. And I explained the challenges that it was not possible to use uh, bricks because there was a need for 100, one lakh, more than one lakh of bricks per day. And also quality of local bricks was not uh, satisfactory. Therefore, fly ash was used. Uh, compressive strength of fly ash, I think it was specified 7.5 megapascal or 75 kilograms per centimeter square, but in, in the end, uh, 90 was uh, 90 MPA was achieved. Uh, and clay bricks were used for foundations and cleaned, so that there was use of clay bricks, but not for uh, above ground. Uh, the plant, I already talked about plant, so you have seen that. Um, in the yesterday, uh, these are some materials. Um, this is a uh, sand, a uh, sand. So this is not only about fly ash; it is about concrete and everything. Um, this is under construction. Lots of uh, materials were needed. Construction process. This is how the campus looked like uh, in 2013. It was a flat ground. Nothing was there. No vegetation, practically, and uh, nothing. So this is the construction process, so enabling the location of foundations, 
uh, and um, construction of foundations at the campus. You can see foundations later on. This may be already cleaned. Um, this is construction going on. Uh, these are reinforcement cages for uh, for uh, different uh, bands and tie beams and tie columns uh, being constructed. These are these cages at the site. As I mentioned, in Mexico, they can have them prefabricated, pre-made, and uh, of the site. Uh, what is interesting here is this. Uh, this is cross-sectional foundation. You can see it's uh, relatively deep, not too deep, 1.2 meters. And then you can see that the plinth beam was uh, uh, 350 millimeters relatively deep, and it there was a ground floor, uh, reinforced concrete floor on slab on grade uh, there as well. So this is a typical foundation detail. Wall thickness was 230 millimeters. Uh, you can see construction again. This is still a plinth level, uh, so clay bricks were used. Um, and you can see now above plint, that is already plint beam. And you can see reinforcement was for tie columns is sticking out of uh, at the plint beam level um, from the plint beam. So reinforcement was anchored into plint beam. So reinforcement did not continue to the bottom of foundation. It was this decided to anchor reinforcement to plint beam. That's why plint beam was made deeper because Constructing uh, foundations for these tie columns in reinforced concrete would significantly increase construction cost, and it was considered to be safe to have this splint beam and anchor these tie columns into, since it is load-bearing masonry construction. This is when this uh, slab uh, slab on grade was constructed and plint top of plint beam was or band was constructed. You can see how where the tie columns are. You can see lots of tie columns at the ground floor level. Anyways, so this is that detail. It is all published in that publication that uh, I will share a link at the end. Um, you can see the tie beam, uh, tie column reinforcement anchored into the anchored here into the tie uh, into the plint uh, band, and that is how the in this particular case of IIT Gandhinagar campus this was done. Uh, these are some construction workers, um, the construction of uh, walls. You can see how they uh, constructed the walls using the um, this. And um, during, these are, uh, I've shown uh, pre earlier these details of tooting. So the question is how they constructed concrete in these uh, tie, uh, tie columns. I will show you that. This is again tooting. This is also tooting at the corners. This is the most challenging location. It is an intersection of two walls, how tie column look like uh, here. And you can see how these tie column cages are really small in spite of being 23 by 23. So less than 23 centimeters, it would be really challenging to construct. So here you can, you can see here details of, um, these are also from that construction publication, how that uh, was achieved with, uh, with tooting. And they had the whole, uh, this was all developed by CPWD engineers who implemented the construction. So you can see details of the, uh, of the hooks in ties. Uh, you can see how long is, uh, if the hook length is according to EDN standards, it's really long for the tie and it interferes uh, uh, with, uh, it obstructs uh, flow of concrete. Um, a little bit. Here is an interesting detail, and uh, this was lots of challenge among the engineers uh, the, on the site, how to uh, attach uh, concrete formwork for the concrete. So the whole system was developed to attach formwork, and you can see also that the construction was done half the floor height, because that enabled a much better um, uh, quality of construction. It was uh, initially difficult to do a full height, but uh, later on they did a full floor height of casting of concrete. Uh, so what they did with the formwork, they attached it uh, through some nails, I will show you. So these are tie columns after construction. You can see it's not ideal, but uh, you can see that it is done. Uh, this is again some formwork details uh, at the tie beam level. And you can see again here how 
a very limited amount of brick masonry is there between lintel, lintel beam and, uh, and uh, the tie, tie beam at the floor level. So just three courses of masonry and they, were, they had to, con to stop the construction of this splint uh, beam, um, uh, lintel beam to, uh, to, uh, before the masonry was constructed. This is formwork for uh, for uh, lintel, or it's actually for a tie a tie um, a beam reinforcement. Uh, this is how formwork was attached, and uh, there are some photograph uh, drawings showing the attachment. So this is how formwork was supported from the ground. This is again example of uh, formwork at the corners between. See, they needed separate former for the part of uh, for part of tie columns. At above the lintel uh, beam, uh, so uh, lintel band. So this is again formwork for tie columns at different location. This is metal formwork which they used in some cases. Um, the other was cardboard or um, some um, fiber, fiber board. Uh, and uh, so here is the way they connected formwork. So they had to draw a nail in the masonry to attach uh, formwork to the to the wall on the side because tie column is here you can see tooting but they had to draw nails so there was a detail and detail is shown here how they had to support formwork first at the bottom and then they draw nails on the sides so it's a little bit elaborate uh, process and here is a cross section showing the how formwork was attached so um, so you will see, as I said, you will have um, uh, access to this, this figure 51 from the publication. So some discussion will be there tomorrow. So here is a good photo showing a lintel uh, band which was constructed. And this is the uh, tie beam, which is uh, at the floor level, how they placed the reinforcement for that. So and this is a construction of a floor slab. So on the on the end, this is the tie beam and this is the floor slab at each floor level reinforced concrete floor as usual in concrete construction. So this is the concrete floor at curing stage. Uh, you can see that uh, they are constructing different levels. Uh, this, um, uh, these buildings, this is a housing, I guess. Uh, this is all housing, yeah. Um, this is pouring of concrete for the slab. So this different construction details with some of which are not related to confined masonry. They're general, like concrete slab is concrete slab, nothing special. So uh, this is concrete slab after construction. You can see again where the tie columns are. Uh, they're continuous uh, and so they can be seen at every level. So this is a nice uh, photo. I, I actually created this. Um, from May 2013, that is, I visited the campus at that time. I took this photo. Then uh, this is photo taken by um, uh, people who were there. September 2013, same place uh, with the construction of the print level. Then uh, July 2014, uh, it's already 60% progress at hostels and 55% at housing. These are professional photos you can see in wide range. And then this is um, at July 2015. You can see monsoon was going on, campus was occupied. This project won the 2015 HATCO Design Award for cost-effective uh, rural and urban housing, including disaster-resistant housing. So it won the award because of the it was confined masonry. So this is the publication I'm suggesting that you download. It's really useful, and uh, I suggest that you take a look at it uh, before tomorrow's discussion with uh, Mr. Anal Shah, uh, who is going to join in a second session tomorrow. And it actually explains the construction. Uh, this one explains and lots of photographs are there. This was done um, uh, with the help of uh, um, our former student Kunal Gaisas, who is the one who did the, uh, the strat and tie model. So he helped with uh, putting together and collecting some photos that we were missing. So I wrote most of it. Professor Sudhir Jain, of course, played important role and few engineers from CPWD were also involved in this publication. So it was a, the purpose of the publication was to document the construction on campus. So that is all for this, uh, this presentation. I'm happy that I managed to transfer it to iPad uh, because I'm using now my uh, mobile um, uh, internet uh, data 
system um, somehow internet uh, uh, crashed uh, at my at my home and um, I could not uh, that's why we had a break so this this is all for this uh, presentation do you have any questions I can uh, stop it's not a problem because I'm on uh, Microsoft Teams I'll stop presenting and uh, you can see me now uh, I'll just Thank you for the patience uh, and understanding. I'm really sorry about the problems. Any questions uh, about uh, about this construction? As I said, there will be a session tomorrow also discussing construction. I was my intention and role was today to give an overview of the construction, and uh, I will share this presentation with uh, Mr. Anal Shah so that he can see what uh, what I shared with you. And uh, so that may be good reference for him for tomorrow as well. Any questions you have? To participants, do we have any questions? You can raise your hand if you have any questions. If not, I know that we've gone uh, over time. Uh, it's uh, time for your lunch or lunch break. But uh, yeah, if there is a question, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, my a little question like regarding the foundation of confined machinery. Is there huh? any special regarding the foundation? Am I audible? Yeah, that, that is yes, 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 you are. Uh, well, a foundation is also covered in the, I believe it is in section nine of the code. So what is, what is, uh, what is uh, permitted is to have a continuous, it is a wall foundation basically. But the, the only challenge is it has to be wall foundation because masonry walls have to be, you know, uh, supported by full foundation, isn't it? So like it is shown in these uh, slides. However, the only question is, where do where do tie uh, the where does the reinforcement stop for tie columns? And as I shown this example from IIT Gandhi Nagar campus, it stopped at the location of this splint beam, but it could be continuous to the bottom. It is not necessary though. And uh, um, in the code, uh, I believe it's section nine. There is a small section on foundations, not too detailed. So both options are odd open regarding the tie beam, uh, tie column reinforcement, but regarding the general reinforcement type, it is so-called, uh, uh, you know, wall foundation type, or you can call it as, uh, um, yeah, wall foundations that like you would have for any masonry building, you would have that type of foundation. And it could be uh, made of uh, brick masonry, as you can see, or masonry, or it could be made of reinforced concrete. I believe that it is cheaper Maybe, or in some parts of India, it's cheaper to make it of, uh, of uh, uh, out of masonry, but it could be made uh, so it is continuous or strip footing, whether it is made out of masonry or concrete, both are permitted for, for this, as long as there is sufficient depth and, uh, you know, design is behind it. It's not just random. It has to bear the weight of all this building. And if it is G plus three, it's like four stories uh, up on top of that uh, foundation. So it has to be engineered uh, for uh, at least for the larger buildings. For small, like bungalow type, I think it could be something uh, prescriptive, but uh, in the ERI guide, there are some, um, you know, prescriptive, uh, because the ERI guide is for really low rise buildings. But in any case, the answer is it's a wall foundation. That's, that's the main thing. And it is in the code, uh, some somewhat covered basics are covered regarding foundations. But that is okay. That's all. That's that's enough, I think. I hope. I think Any so other actually, questions? Uh, yes? Maybe there is some con uh, connection issues with the, the, the participant that asked question. We'll be sharing then the answer later. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so so uh, so is the issue with the uh, the participant so maybe yes, i can the share question. the answer in the, in the chat or i should share but i can share by email and you can share it in the afternoon session in the, the last session of today no, any other questions 
I got it, ma'am. I got it. Thank you. Thank ah, you. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay, okay. So, yeah, no, no problem. I can, I can share by email and then you can share in chat if you want. Any other questions? As I said, more there will be a full session on construction, um, which would be, of course, on IIT Gandhi Nagar, but it could uh, pose, you can ask any construction related questions. And uh, both Mr. Shah and I will be there. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the questions will be answered. It's an important issue. It's a new technology as far as the construction is concerned. You could see these issues with the forework and so on. Uh, but uh, there are definitely important construction questions to be asked. If not, then maybe for the, in the sake of lunch break, since we have opportunity tomorrow, uh, then uh, we can continue this discussion in the second session tomorrow regarding construction. And I will share with you all these annotated uh, uh, presentations, plus, um, as I said, the ERI guide and the Mexican code. So I will share with Professor Chetani and uh, you will get it uh, later later today, that would be. And I also promised yesterday to share that example on the white column model that was done by Professor Juan Jose. And I will share that as well separately. I didn't have time to find it, the full, uh, the, all the documentation, and I will do that. Yes, one more question, Manisha. Manisha? Very good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm audible, madam. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, madam, uh, my question was that a uh, lot of uh, uh, things you have elaborated uh, on uh, confined machinery, uh, mm -hmm. but the old historical buildings, uh, generally where the confined machinery is represented between uh, two stones or two rocks or rock blocks, mostly they were used uh, in olden times. Uh -huh. um, uh, is there any method or any uh, means uh, things which have been developed to understand that why this type of confinement remained stable and it and it's still working till day today or any entity techniques have been developed to identify those things? You know, I think it would be maybe there are and there are experts who are specifically studying historical. Mason, in, for example, in India, it's uh, Professor Arun Menon uh, is one of them at IIT Madras, and then they are in uh, Europe, Paulo Lorenzo. So I am not familiar how it was, um, you know, studied, uh, but I'm sure that it was studied. It's just that I don't have information. But you're absolutely right. Some of the old techniques also worked, but sometimes we cannot replicate them. It's not practical. But please know that in these old buildings, um, there was um, the walls were usually much thicker and all that. So it was different masonry also. Uh, and um, but I don't know. I, I don't have answer to your question because just I did not study that and uh, I don't know where to find. But uh, I can give you contacts of some um, experts who could answer that question. And I'm sure they will usually people answer. As I said, in India, Professor Arun Menon, in, uh, he probably would know the answer or would know where to find it. He is at IIT Madras. Maybe you know him or you know of him. Yeah. So he is, uh, he is, he is, he is definitely, uh, that is his topic. Uh, yeah. So it, it would go by, um, I, I believe that uh, a lot of research has been done into historic masonry and uh, good research and uh, it's really important. But I'm not, uh, I don't have, I'm more in modern masonry as you can see and that's my uh, time most is spent on that <laughs> so oh. sorry about that all right so thank you thank you ma thank you ma you're welcome thank you. so so maybe if, uh, if you want it's i'm not sure what's the time now in india it's uh, for maybe two o'clock uh, already uh so i'm not sure when you're going to start the afternoon session maybe you can announce that uh, and uh, I guess that we close this and we continue. We have two more sessions together tomorrow. Uh, I mean, I will be also in the session with the Mr. Shack, so uh, we'll have this yes. good discussion. Yes. Thank you so much for today's session. We had a pleasurable time. And also, we'd like the participants to know that we'll be uh, starting the next session at 2.30 p.m. 2.30, okay. In 20 minutes, we'll start around 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, you, have a good afternoon. See you tomorrow. You too, bye bye. Bye. bye.